um, welcome everyone to Shivali's book online. Uh, we are the oldest independent bookstore in Los Angeles. This is actually our 80th year in business of hopefully many, many more to come. Tonight, we are excited to be hosting Dr. Brennan Spiegel for his new book, VRX, pictured here. Um, I just wanted to say this event is especially exciting because VRX is one of those rare books that makes you feel like we are truly entering a new frontier in medicine and a new frontier in human progress overall. It's very exciting stuff. Um, in conversation with Dr. Spiegel today is someone who knows this very intimately, Tom Norris. He has worked on behalf of the American Chronic Pain Association for the last 26 years. He is also currently participating as a consultation patient partner at Cedar sinai and the National Institute of Health on the use of VR for lower back pain management. Tom's main role today will be to interrogate our main star for the night, Dr. Brennan Spiegel. <laughs> Dr. Spiegel's team has developed one of the largest, most widely documented medical virtual reality programs at Cedar sinai His work has created a whole new field of medicine called Medical Extended Reality, or MXR, where we use immersive technologies like VR to treat conditions ranging from pain, anxiety, to dementia. He has quite the resume. If I read the whole thing, we would be here for a very long time. So I'm going to end with my favorite part of Dr. Siegel's background, which is that he is a Chevalier's local author and knows the bookstore and the street that we're on very, very well. Um, okay, enough for me. I'd like to hand over the virtual stage to Dr. Brennan Spiegel and Tom Norris. Please give them a very warm online welcome. Ah, thank you. Well, I can hear it from here. So thank you, Teresa. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, do this event tonight and to um, meet with our community. As you said, I grew up in the community. I am from uh, Hancock Park. I grew up right at Larch on Larchmont, almost on Larchmont practically, going to the barber shop for the haircuts, uh, Chevaliers for many years. I, in fact, I wrote most of this book um, in Groundworks Coffee on, on Larchmont just a few doors down from Chevaliers. And each day, each you know, evening when I would leave after working on the book, I would walk past the bookstore and think, oh, I hope one day they've got, they've got this book in stock. So it's really kind of fun to, both as a, somebody that grew up in the, in the neighborhood to know that um, the bookstore actually has my book at the local bookstore. So that's, that's exciting. Um, so as you heard, I'm a professor of medicine and public health. Uh, I'm here, as you can see behind me, this is Cedar sinai and I uh, direct, um, I'm a research director here at Cedar sinai and I'm also on faculty at UCLA. I'm an assistant dean in the medical school, uh, and I never really thought I'd be saying all this stuff growing up uh, here on Larchmont, so it's fun to, to be able to come full circle again. And before I get too far, and I'm going to share with you a bit more about what this book is about, uh, I just want to make sure that we have a moment to introduce Tom, who's as Teresa said, is going to interrogate me. And when I hear that, he, actually, Tom has a very robust military history. So that makes me a little nervous about the interrogation. But Tom, tell the, tell the folks about who you are and, and, and why you're here. No waterboarding, Dr. Brennan, <laughs> trust oh, <God>. me. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, my name is Tom Norris. I live in historic West Adams now. Um, happily married to Mary Ann Mullaliley, who was an actress. Uh, I've lived with chronic pain daily, uh, starting with a, uh, oh, I think it's about 36 years now while I was in the military. And I started using VR a couple of years ago at uh, Dr. Spiegel's uh, invitation. And now it's uh, an everyday part of my toolbox for chronic pain management. Um, I guess that's about it. I'm, you know, I'm very active with uh, advocacy for people with chronic pain. And I run uh, chronic pain support groups under the auspices of the American Chronic Pain Association. Back well, to you, we're gonna, thank you, Tom, and we'll come back and you'll interrogate me and I'll interrogate you and find out more about what is all this stuff with VR for pain. And so what I thought I would do uh, is just to get everyone started, um, I want to share a couple uh, slides and just a brief little introduction to this field that probably most of you have never heard of before. Um, and this book is entitled VRX, uh, How Virtual Therapeutics Will Revolutionize Medicine. And you can see this is a picture of me with a patient at Cedar sinai uh, She's allowed us to show her image. And she's one of about 3,000 patients now at Cedars who have used virtual reality. And she's holding this device in her hand. 
and looking at it and contemplating whether or not she should use it for the pain that she's been experiencing. And I'll show you a, a little brief video of her using it in a, in a second. So the book we're talking about is this, um, and uh, you know we're going to talk more about what VR is. And I really love the co the cover. It, you know the, this multi colored kind of technicolor explosion is beautiful with this sort of black background and it has a metaphorical meaning. It's sort of this light that comes out of the darkness and we'll, um, we'll uh, talk more about what that means. By the way, we're gonna take questions um, after we do a little introduction and Tom will talk a little bit and then we're gonna have a lot of time for questions. So you can start putting questions in the chat if you'd like and we'll make sure to get to as many questions as we can. So this is a patient at Cedar sinai who um, is sitting there in a, with a headset on his face. And he's in the middle of a pain crisis from sickle cell anemia. But at this particular moment, he's actually on a helicopter flying over fjords in Iceland. And you can see the expression on his face. You can see this sort of like wow moment. And it's hard to tell at this moment that he's in pain. And I'll again show you a little bit more of his story as well. Here's uh, another patient who I've taken care of, um, who's also allowed us to show her image. And she has uh, liver disease and has been experiencing some distress in the hospital. At this moment, she's sitting on a beach in Hawaii as she's in the hospital. And I'll show you what happens with her as well. So these are VR headsets. And some of you may never have used this before. Others may have used it, and it's really, most people, when they think of this, they think of it as a, a, a technology for gaming, for kids to play first-person shooter games, you know, in their parents' basement or something. And, you know, it is that. These are used for gaming, but it turns out we can also use these to help with a wide variety of medical conditions. And I'm going to show you how it works and then um, give you some stories of how we've been able to learn about how it works. And then we'll talk more about it with Tom, who, as you've heard, has been using it himself, along with a number of other tools. Now, I'm a regular old doctor. I'm not some mind-body doctor. I'm not sort of like a new age guru. I had not even heard of virtual reality, much less using it for pain management, um, until about five or six years ago, when this guy, and I start the book with this story, named uh, Walter Greenleaf. He's a professor up at Stanford. And he came into my lab and he said, you know what, I want you to put this thing on your head. And I did. And I was standing in a conference room. And some of you may have heard me tell the story before. So I apologize if you've heard this, but I want to start for those that haven't. And I found myself standing on the side of a window washer rig. And this is literally what I saw. And the way it works in virtual reality is wherever you look is what you see. And I'm moving around and all of a sudden my brain thinks that I am literally standing on the side of a building. And I'm looking around and I'm noticing these details like that rotary right, down there. And I can hear the sound of creaking cables and my body's starting to sway back and forth. And I'm really starting to feel a little bit afraid of heights, but at least I'm secure behind that railing. But all of a sudden, just as I'm getting comfortable way up high, they release the railing and it falls 50 stories to the ground and it smashes on the ground and I can hear it. And I started getting short of breath and they said, all right, now jump off the building. And I always say the story the same way. I say, no chance, I'm not gonna jump off this building. And they said, but you know that your feet are standing on carpet. And I said, my feet know that, but my brain doesn't know that. My brain thinks I'm about to die. But the only way I was able to do it is I had to cheat. There's a little bit of light coming through the headset and I can look through it and I saw the carpet. And that was enough to break the illusion to allow me to take this baby step and fall 50 stories to my virtual death. And it was terrifying and everything turned to white. And I thought, oh my God, if we can use this for evil, we must be able to use this for good. There's something about this thing that it hijacks the brain. Now that's the first time that I died in virtual reality. I want to now tell you the second time I died in virtual reality and what it taught me and what it led me to, to eventually write this book that, that we're talking about today. This is the University of Barcelona. I went and traveled out to visit this guy. And I tell this story as well in the beginning of the book. His name is Mel Slater and he's a professor of virtual reality. There's such a thing. And he, I went to his laboratory and I was in this room 
which is rather nondescript room with black awnings. And he sat me down on that chair and he asked me to kick my feet out on that coffee table. And this is his postdoc, Ramon Oliva. And he hooked me up with sensors on my ankles and on my wrists. And then they put a headset on my face. And all of a sudden that black room turned into this. And I'm looking around with these two, with one, one per eye, and I'm looking around and I notice that the room has turned into this beautiful living room with paintings and furniture and oak wood. And I'm thinking, wow, what happened here? And next thing they know, I know, they asked me to start moving my feet and to trace out those blue lines on the table. And my feet are moving in perfect one-to-one -one synchrony with those, uh, with those legs. And I'm thinking, whose legs are those? You know, they move like my legs, they look like my legs, but are those my legs? I mean, somewhere in that room, there's a computer running thousands of lines of code to convince me into thinking that was my body. It was like being in the matrix. Well, next thing that happened is these balls started falling from the ceiling. And as each ball hit my body, I could feel it. I can literally feel it because it vibrated in the exact moment that the ball hit my body. Okay, so at this point, I had what Dr. Slater calls full body ownership. I literally thought I was that body. And what happened next is hard for me to put into words. And I always try my best to do it when I tell the story and I do it in the book as well. But what happened next is hard to put into words. What happened next is all of a sudden I detached from my body and I started to float up to the ceiling. And this is what happened. And the balls continued to follow me and I could still feel them. I was still moving. But I looked down at that body that I had just occupied and it was not moving. That body was vacant. I was in motion, but that body was not. I had died. I had had a complete out-of-body experience. Somehow this computer through a digital parlor trick had violated something as essential as my own physical coordinates in space. And I realized that this was almost a mystical, almost spiritual experience. And I learned at this moment, and I still remember it three years later as I tell the story, that the process of dying does not need to be catastrophic. It could actually be spiritual. And maybe I should fear death just a little bit less. And it turns out that Professor Slater has published this study, a virtual out-of-body experience reduces fear of death. And he was able to show that in this randomized controlled trial, which was amazing. So I'm, I'm starting with these stories, and this is how I start the book, because I thought, what in the world happened in my brain? I needed some answers, having had an out-of-body experience. And I spend the first part of the book trying to understand what is it about virtual reality? It's a tool that can modify perception. Sure, we can play games with it, but it can modify our perception of the world around us and the world within us. And if we use it to recalibrate unhealthy perceptions, it can become a radical therapy to improve quality of life. So that's the idea. Now I wanna tell another story here as I kind of finish my opening comments. This is a picture of dolphins swimming and you can hear some music hopefully. And this is an example of one of the videos that we use in our patient, with our patients at Cedar sinai who often are in the hospital and distressed or in pain. And when they put the headset on, they can swim with the dolphins. And so, I had a patient a couple years ago with very severe abdominal pain. And we couldn't really figure out what was causing the abdominal pain. So what we decided to do was put her in this environment and we did. And after about four minutes, she started to cry. And I said, are you okay? She said, yeah, I think I know why I have this pain. And I said, really, what is it? And she said, it's my brother. I said, your brother? Tell me more. She said, yeah, my brother died of stomach cancer and I'm going to die that way too. And I said, well, but we've looked in your stomach. We did a, a, an endoscopy. We put a camera in your stomach and you don't have cancer in your stomach. And she said, you know, I know that. I know that. You guys keep telling me that. I haven't been willing to accept it, but these dolphins are telling me I need to accept it. I need to move on with my life. And she said a year on the couch, I wouldn't have come, come to this conclusion, but somehow these dolphins are telling me to. And by the way, my pain is better. I want to go home. Now, I didn't have a brain scanner to see what was happening in her brain at that moment. And, but we see this over and over again, and we're starting to learn what actually is happening in the brain. And this is a study that shows what's happening in the brain. 
when somebody is using virtual reality. And what you're showing here, what, I'm, what you're seeing here on the left is a, is a person who's in pain. And you can see the brain signals in their brain, for like, for like a fire. When they're in virtual reality, the brain signals tamp down. And what's an inter interesting is if you look at the location of the pain signals, this is called the sensory cortex. This is where you feel the physical pain. But this part in the middle is the emotional part of the pain. That's where the emotions are processed. So not only does it reduce the physical pain, but it reduces the emotional pain. And that points out that there are two parts to pain. And Tom will talk about this in, in a second here. And the Buddha called this the two arrows of pain. Buddha said the first arrow is when you get hit by the archer and it hurts. But the second arrow is the self-inflicted wound. That's when you look at the first arrow and you say, I'm gonna die. What's happening to me? This is the existential anxiety that sometimes is more severe than the actual physical pain. VR, it appears, can reduce both types of pain. And this is an example of that. This is a famous study of people with severe burn injuries who are undergoing bandage changes at the University of Washington. And what you're looking at here, the black bar is virtual reality and the white bar is no virtual reality. Not only did it reduce their worst pain, but also how much time they spent thinking about pain and the unpleasantness of the pain. That means both the physical and the emotional components of the pain. But yet they also had more fun, which is a very curious thing to measure in somebody who's undergoing bandage changes for a burn injury. I wanna show this to you because we just published this study from Cedar sinai This is virtual reality during childbirth. We've done a study recently of women undergoing labor and delivery. And what you're looking at is the drop in pain was larger for people in VR versus control. So we can now show that it actually reduces not only the pain of childbirth, but people feel like the childbirth goes by faster when they're randomized to virtual reality. So this is our hospital. And if you go into our hospital, it looks like this. And if you sit in that bed all day, it looks like this. And then maybe I come by and then I disappear and then I come by again and then I disappear. This is no way to be living. So we've been working on how can we do better than that? What if we can allow people to escape the four walls of the hospital? You know, if they can, for example, um, you know, go to, you know, uh, go on a safari or go to, um, you know, go to uh, Africa, or maybe they can uh, sort of travel to fantastical destinations instead of being cooped up in the hospital all the time. So that's the idea of using virtual reality in the hospital. And I wanna show you if this works, two of our patients using virtual reality. Let's see if this works. So we'll see uh, if it helps with the pain or not. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll tell us. Yes. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, any okay. questions about that? Pull that down over your eyes now. Should load up. Whoa. What do you see? Um, horses. Yep, okay. And okay. over the bridge, is that, is mm -hmm. that working? Yes. What's happening now? The helicopter, waterfalls. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been to Iceland? No. With the music and everything, it's real peaceful. Oh, it's people. Hey. Oh, cool. So what'd you think? It, it's really, it's pretty relaxing. Uh huh. Especially with the music and everything, and then the different scenery. Like there was this one part where it's um like a waterfall, you're sitting in a cave. Right. And it's a waterfall right next to you. Almost made me forget I was here. Like, like, cause you're there. Right. It's like, <clears throat> you're really there. You're hearing the waterfall and everything is a, like, you look around and it's the whole scenery. Right. It's like you're immersed in it. How did it make you feel? Relaxed, very relaxed. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about the pain. You weren't? No, I wasn't. Really? I was just thinking about being there uh -huh. and having a good time. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, let Dr. Herman know. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank but, you. Uh, good. Okay. Yes, but I really did like it. I enjoyed it really much. Excellent. Thank you so much You're for welcome. taking me. So these stories were really shocking to see for somebody like me that uses medicine all day. And so we decided we better study this. And we did a study recently where we took people like those patients with pain and we randomized them to two different groups. One group 
got to sit in virtual reality worlds like this while they're in the hospital. They can go to fantastical worlds and just sort of be wherever they want. And with this example, you can actually be with your family. You can bring in photographs of your family and be with them inside of these different kind of trippy worlds. The other group got to just watch TV, a health and wellness channel on the television, you know, yoga, nice fun stuff like that. And when we looked at it, we saw that virtual reality led to a larger pain reduction compared to watching TV. And especially in people with severe pain, eight, nine or 10 out of a 10 point scale, a lot more benefit there. And these are some pictures of what they see. So I'm gonna to skip to the end because I wanna to get to Tom, but we just I just touched the surface here. There's a lot of other examples I talk about in the book and these are some of them. And we have a website too, where you can see a lot more if you're interested in this. It's called virtualmedicine.org or virtualmedicine.health. And there's a lot more information and research and videos and so on. And then, so the book itself tells all these stories and it talks about what does VR teach us about consciousness and about mind-body medicine and about philosophy and neuroscience and, and clinical medicine and technology. So anyway, since we're in Hollywood, I need to end with a scroll because uh, I get to talk about this stuff, but there's many, many people at Cedar sinai who help with this research and including many of our students, some of whom are UCLA students and UCLA medical students and uh, residents at Cedar sinai So I wanna make sure to thank all these people um, who get to, uh, whose research I get to present. And if any of you are on Twitter, I'm on Twitter and you can uh, follow us there. So thanks so much. And now I wanna kick it over to Tom who can talk a bit about maybe how you've been using it as a patient and what your experiences are. Sure. And, sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you know. thank you. Thank you very much. Also, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. I think it's really great for, for those of us who are dealing with pain every day. Uh, before I go into my own experience with uh, VR, I have to tell people about your book. Uh, frankly, I thought this book was going to be really saturated with science and jargon, and I would have to wade through it. It's far from that. It's a fantastic book written extremely well, and it's for anybody who's interested in virtual reality or seeing where virtual reality can go in the future, what's being done now and go in the future where it's gonna be used you know, for everybody. Uh, I, I thank you for writing it. Uh, it's extremely well done. Um, my experience with VR has been, if I could sum it up, basically I would say it's enabled me to relax more. Uh, I breathe better. And I spend less time looking at my pain or focusing on my pain. So I've been able to add VR to my toolbox of everything I use to, to maintain control. And it really, I asked myself why it worked. And it really has come down to it reinforce the mind body connection in that I've always believed that the mind, we don't know the powers of the mind and that the mind can help you deal with any difficulty, whether it's physical or mental. Um, the, uh, the book itself, as I said, starts out with explaining virtual reality, how it started. Uh, the second part is how VR is being used right now. And the third part is the future. And, and Doc, uh, I, can't, I can't praise this new, therapy enough. I think it's going to be helpful for anybody who's willing to try it. I think it will be uh, a great asset for pain management in the future. So uh, do you mind if I ask you a question? Yeah, please. And, and ready? those of you that are listening, start putting your questions in. I see one is in already, and I'll answer that when we get to that as well. Thanks. Go ahead, okay. Tom. Yeah. Uh, you're looking at, at virtual reality for as a therapy for everything. And oh, that reminds me, congratulations on the recognition for the National Institute of Health uh, approval for fibromyalgia and virtual reality study. That's, that's a fantastic thing because there's so many people with chronic pain uh, who with fibromyalgia could use some help. But my question is, have you looked at virtual reality as a therapy for help managing uh, something like diabetes. I know that you did a study on uh, uh, salt and, and, and consumption, but is there a possibility that you could actually use this to help people manage their blood sugar more? Yeah, 
so one one opportunity of VR is is really for education also. So you mentioned, um, uh, and that may be helpful for disease management for chronic diseases. So you mentioned this example of salt in, uh, reduction. We did a study with the Holman United Methodist Church in the South Adams District, um, West Adams District, which I think you live right near there. Um, right there. And, right? And right. Uh, we worked with uh, the pastor, Kelvin Sauls, to create a VR program because he was worried that too many of his parishioners had high blood pressure. And he actually asked us to use VR to help reduce their blood pressure, which was crazy. Well, not crazy, it was just very innovative for him to think to do that. And we developed a VR experience where the parishioners would go fly into their body and watch as salt affected their brain, their heart, their blood vessels, their kidney. And then they went into a kitchen and they learned about where salt is in the diet and how to reduce it. And then the pastor himself came on and he sort of prayed on it. And we showed when in virtual reality that they were so engaged with the experience that their blood pressure dropped by seven points on average over the next three months. Uh, partly because of the virtual reality intervention. So could we do the same thing for other diseases? Um, it's been used in HIV, for example, to help improve adherence with medications. Diabetes is a really important area where there's so much to learn about the biochemistry of diabetes and, and sugar and insulin. And if you learn it viscerally, not by reading a book or a brochure, but literally flying through your body, you may be more likely to, um, to do the right things with diet and education. Uh, you know, there are of course other opportunities like physical activity using, uh, doing, for, for, for example, we know exercise can improve diabetes and many other cardiovascular conditions. And there's Tai Chi in virtual reality. You can do boxing, you can do all sorts of different exercises. Um, but you know, we should do that with, with the doctor's oversight. But that's an interesting sure. idea. Uh, one of the things that, that I've, seen a lot in my support groups is people feel like the doctors aren't communicating to them or with them that the doctors are are removed they're, they're being treated like they're in an ivory tower uh do you see virtual reality and and the new doctors that'll be called virtualists uh helping doctors and patients connect better yeah, so um, one part of the book I, I, I talk about, it's called the empathy machine. And, and some people, this guy Chris Milk came up with this term, the empathy machine, that VR allows us to empathize with other people in very different ways. And it is allowing us as doctors to empathize with our patients. And that leads to new and different uh, conversations. Unlike other technologies that avert my eyes, that take my eyes away from my patients, like the computer systems that I have to turn my back and type all the time with the patient in the room, I'd much rather be able to look at patients. And you saw the first picture that I showed, we're facing each other. And, and what this VR is doing is it's requiring me to understand the subjective nature of disease, the psychosocial nature of disease. And that leads to very different types of conversations. When I prescribe virtual reality, the first question is, well, what is this? And how does it work? And and why would it work? And it, it leads to totally different discussions than if I were to say, here's a pill for your irritable bowel syndrome. I may still give a pill, but I might also give virtual reality, for example. So it's a little roundabout answer to question, but it, it does lead us to think differently about our patients, for sure. And I have a whole chapter of the book dedicated to that. I, th I think that's great because, you know, it's that seems to be the, crom the common pro most common problem with people with uh, dealing with chronic pain. Uh, one more question. Uh, you talked in the book about a, an individual with, uh, I think you had an amputated leg. Uh, yeah. Can you describe how VR could help somebody with, uh, say, a stroke or yeah. an amputation? Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's a great question. And, and VR is actually FDA, there's FDA cleared technology now for stroke rehabilitation. So you might wonder, like, how does that work? So for example, um, and the amputation is similar, but I'll take the stroke for, for first. Let's say you can't move your right arm. It's paralyzed, right side of your body's paralyzed and you're trying to get it to move. So if you put on a VR headset, what we can do is you can see these digital arms, just like I showed you my digital legs earlier. And you look and you see these two arms, but they're digital arms, but you feel like they're your arms. And so if you were to try to move your right arm in real life, you can't do it because it's paralyzed. 
But in VR, we can flip it. It's called mirror therapy. And what that means is I might say, okay, now move your left arm. But what's actually happening is we flip it and the right arm moves. So in the virtual world, you suddenly have full control over your paralyzed limb. And what does that do to the brain? It starts to lay down new networks. The brain is very plastic, it, it's, it's malleable, and it can start to lay down new networks. The brain thinks that it now has control over this arm. And what's amazing is if you're looking from outside, you might actually see the, the, the real arm twitch just a little bit because the brain is sending new signals down. Same thing with phantom limb, where people have had an amputation and they feel like they still have that limb and it can be very painful. And uh, it turns out, um, this guy Ramachandran years ago discovered that if you use a mirror, and I talk about this in the book, and, and you have a reflection of your arm, you think that you have restored your arm and the brain is convinced it's back. But it's hard to actually do that with a mirror. In virtual reality, you can trick convince your brain that you have your arm back. And the brain says, oh, okay, in that case, it doesn't need to hurt anymore. And it's amazing that it, that it works at all, whether it's with a mirror or digitally with a digital mirror, it, it does work. That's great. Yeah. I think since we've got 11 questions, we better move on to the questions. Yeah, absolutely, there's some great questions coming in. And um, uh, Teresa, you just let us know if you have questions as well, so we can start going through some of these. So the first one is from, yes, Teresa, did you wanna jump in first? I was going to, to be honest, but I feel like because we have a dozen questions, um, I'm going to hold off. Um, if we have the chance for me to ask a question, then we can do it. But let's get to these people first. Okay, so let's go through these and um, we'll keep it moving. So the first one's from Serge. Um, and um, the question is, what do you think is the greatest obstacle standing between VR treatment and mass adoption of this? And, you know, it's interesting because I don't think science is the obstacle anymore. There are over five thousand studies looking at this. So it's not that we need another 5,000 studies. The obstacles have more to do with, okay, who's going to pay for this? <laughs> are insurance companies paying for this? Uh, why or why not? Um, who is actually going to distribute these headsets? Who's going to clean the headsets? You know, we're in a pandemic right now. Whether we're in a pandemic or not, we need people to manage these headsets, clean them, sterilize them. Um, the big one is really paying for them. And we've been working with insurance companies. And in fact, the FDA has now called this new field of medicine, uh, they have a name for it. They call it medical extended reality or MXR. So it's really gratifying to us that the, that the FDA came up with a name for this for what we do, which is very cool. And just two weeks ago, the FDA has given a special designation to VR as a quote, breakthrough technology for pain management. And, and what that actually means is it could have insurance implications um, for payment. So we work with Travelers Insurance, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield is currently looking at this and hopefully we'll get more people paying for this and then you'll see more doctors doing it. But there's still over 200 hospitals in the, in the US right now doing it and more and more practitioners are doing this as well. So I think that's the answer to that question. Um, the next question is, does it help with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD? And the answer is absolutely. In fact, some of the, the richest data is a PTSD, and I talk about some of this in the book. A lot of this has been out of USC, uh, Southern, you know, University of Southern California, as opposed to South, uh, South Carolina. And um, uh, Skip Rizzo is a professor there who's been working with, uh, particularly with soldiers who have PTSD from combat exposure. And what he can do in his lab at USC, and now people are doing this in the VA system, is they put them in a VR headset and they feel like they're back in a Humvee. They can smell um, uh, the fuel. Uh, they pump the smell of fuel into the room and they have a vibrating floor. So like they're driving in a Humvee and then they reproduce uh, explosives going off and they reproduce and, and create the panic attack. But then what they do is they slowly start exposing them to it bit by bit until they develop a resilience and no longer have that panic from the po that, that post-traumatic stress response. So that's one example. It's also being used for phobias, by the way. Uh, you're afraid of flying, afraid of heights. You saw, I'm, I'm a little afraid of heights. I had to practice jumping off that building. So anyway, yes, it can help with PTSD. There's a question about, do you have a, a functional MRI evidence or fMRI evidence that VR can create new neural connections or pathways? So we don't have 
a direct, uh, that I'm aware of, direct evidence of new pathways forming at this point. But we do know that similar types of treatments like meditation um, uh, and cognitive behavioral therapy can change not just the structure of the brain, but the functions of the brain. It can literally change gray white matter interface and all sorts of specific areas in the amygdala to the fear center can literally change with chronic beha behavior, with cognitive behavioral therapies. We think VR is very similar and we use a form of VR that is an eight week CBT treatment experience where it's almost like having a pain psychologist with you at home. Um, so, but we haven't done a study with MRIs to, to prove that it changes the brain, but we think it probably does. So that's the strict answer to that question. Ah, okay, from Jeff Nair. Hey, Jeff, this Jeff is our, uh, is our neighbor. Um, how long is the residual effect of VR when the headset is removed? So that's a great question because the natural question is, well, okay, great. So they're feeling good when the headset's on, but when you take it off, are they immediately back in pain? Well, sometimes, yes, sometimes people are right back in pain, but in many cases, they're not. And that's the really interesting thing is people will take the headset off and they'll say, oh my goodness, I feel so much better. It's almost like the brain has been temporarily inoculated against the pain. And there's some reasons why that happens. And I won't get into too much of the neuroscience, but it turns out our brain can fight back. Our brain can block pain signals from coming up the spinal cord. And it can actually send signals down to block the pain signals. And if the brain is comfortable and relaxed, it doesn't have time for pain and it will block the pain from coming up. So for a period of time, we call this a, uh, an analgesia tail. There's a tail where people will continue to have pain benefits. Now it may not last forever, but you know, opioids don't last forever either. So uh, this is better than an opioid, we think. And um, in some cases, people just learn that they have control over their body. And they, they otherwise would have needed to practice like a Buddhist monk for 40,000 hours in a cave somewhere to figure out how to do this. But with 10 minutes in VR, they start to realize, wow, I do have this control over my body. And that alone is worth it. Okay, uh, oh, hey, Alan Perlman. Uh, what about chronic pain from lupus? So it turns out the first picture that I showed of me sitting across from that young woman, um, and she's allowed us to show her image, but she does have uh, lupus and she has been experiencing pain from lupus. And we have actually shown that it can help with that type of pain. In fact, it helps with, it doesn't matter what the pain is from. Um, and that's because this isn't working at the level of the pain, it's working at the level of the brain. So it's changing the way the brain is perceiving the pain. It's not going to cure cancer, it's not a magic wand, it's not gonna break a, you know, heal a broken bone, but it can, and, and not in everyone either, but in many people it can help change the way the pain is perceived and then gain control over it. I think that's a lot of what you're talking about, Tom. Uh, yes. I don't wanna, uh, hey Tom, what do you think of that one? Because of this whole idea of the brain having some control, because that's what you're talking about. Yeah, that, that's basically the reason I, I know that virtual reality works for me because I'm of the mindset that, you know, there is a very strong body, brain, mind connection. And that uh, I'm afraid I kind of believe if I can think it, I can do it. So yeah, I, I think it's, it allows virtual reality to work for anybody with any kind of pain. I hope it does. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, I, I guess it's a matter of faith for me. I, you know, everybody's going to have a different viewpoint, but it, it comes from a matter of faith in myself and, and what my mind can do. Uh, that's, right. that's a weird answer, but that's, that's about the best. And in I medicine do. and psychology, we call that self-efficacy. So yes. if you go in, you know, so that, and the question, oh, is this just a placebo? Is this just distraction? I don't know, that's why we compare it to a control condition and it seems to do better than control conditions. But yeah, if you go in with the right mindset, you're probably gonna have a better outcome. And that's, that's not such a bad thing. Uh, what, yeah. One thing I'd like to add to that, Doc, is I have uh, shared the VR hood with my, my group. And, and the, an example I can give of the change in mindset is I showed it to an individual who was very, very upset, very, very whiny, uh, excuse me for using that word, but but very, very down. And she put on the virtual headset and within three minutes, 
she was laughing like she was at a party. And when she took the headset off after about five minutes, she was in a much better mood and her pain wasn't so bad. Well, it's so interesting to see that happen when it happens. Like it's also used, for example, with dementia. And there are, if you go online and type into Google virtual reality and dementia, you'll see these videos of similar kind of thing. Now, you, the, the person you're describing didn't have dementia, but there's, there's stories and examples where somebody can be very upset and crying and confused, but then you put them in a VR headset and bring them back to their childhood home in VR using Google Maps stereoscopically or into a, a, a place that they visited years ago. And all of a sudden, just like a light switch, laughter, talk, telling stories, engaging, reminiscing. It's called digital reminiscence therapy. And, and in Alzheimer's disease, it's very, very effective, which is amazing how it can do that. So it just reboots the brain in some people. And I don't want people here to think, oh my God, this is, a, this is a magic wand, it's a miracle. It's not those things, but it can work. Um, anyway, so here's a question which is very pragmatic. Can, how do you um, sterilize and clean these things? Uh, well, guess what? I, I'm going to show that to you because I think I have it right here. Look at that. Look how prepared I was for that question. So, um, uh, <laughs> although I can't quite see the, uh, the uh, mouse on the screen. So anyway, um, this is uh, how we do it. We use germicidal wipes uh, all across every surface we can. We have these alcohol-based lens wipes, and then we have a special box. I know UV light has somehow become a political thing with our president for COVID, but um, it actually does work. Um, I'm not gonna talk about COVID, but it actually does work for COVID in, a, we have a special UV light box specifically designed for these headsets. It bathes them in UVC light. And then after all that, we just let, we quarantine them for a few days and uh, then they're clean. So that's kind of how, how that works. Um, so the next question is, if you, need this for if you need this for depression, does insurance cover it? God, I wish it did. And I didn't talk about depression much today, but there's in the book I do. And there's some amazing examples for depression where you can, where you can actually um, have, um, you do therapy with yourself, but through somebody else. You can do therapy through the body of Sigmund Freud if you'd like, and you switch roles back and forth between Sigmund Freud and yourself. It's crazy. Um, there's evidence that this actually works. It's a little hard to explain, but it's in the book. And there are companies now that do offer this form of, of VR therapy for depression. But insurance does not cover it, uh, but some therapists are using virtual reality as part of their practice. And so there is, um, I, I, you know, there, there's actually a guy, Howard Gurr, except he's in Long Island, that has created a website with names of people um, who offer this service. Um, and uh, I, I don't have that handy, but maybe afterwards people can contact me if they want to get that information. Um, oh, somebody heard me on Sirius Doctor Radio. I was excited and bought two books. Great. Um, by the way, if you're going to buy books, buy them through Chevaliers. That's, what we, that's why we're doing this. So buy them through, support our local bookstore. Um, but I can't find how to purchase apps that are health oriented. If I buy them on, on Oculus, are they available? So what this all means is Oculus um, is the company that may, you've been pricing a lot of commercials. If you've been watching the Dodgers World Series, go Dodgers. If you've been watching the NBA playoffs, you've been seeing all these commercials for the, for the virtual reality headsets called Oculus. And what's nice about Oculus is they have a store. So when you buy the headset, and I don't work for this company, so you could go to any company, but that company, you buy the headset, it's a very good headset and you can download stuff. Uh, one of the ones that I showed you today is called Trip VR, T R I P P. And also, I have nothing to do with that company, but they, you can buy that stuff and download it right to your headset, and it's great. Another one is called Nature Trek, also a really good example. And uh, soon on our website, we are going to put a list of all of our favorite apps. So, because uh, I get this question so much that we're working on that right now. And uh, if you go to the virtualmedicine.org, um, and check back in a few weeks, we're gonna have a list of all of our favorite apps, but I just mentioned a few. Um, okay, uh, I'll keep moving. Are we okay, Teresa? Can I keep burning through these? Yeah, um, let's, let's just get through as many as we can. It seems like people are really interested in this field. Yeah, good, good. 
Um, as you think about VR apps and healthcare that are most promising, are there commonalities that distinguish them? Yes. And in fact, I have a chapter of the book dedicated to this too. Um, because you know, most developers are not thinking about patients and their illness experiences and their vulnerabilities, and they're thinking about gaming. And you know, games are good. There's something called serious games, which is where you play games for serious purposes, like ma managing pain, and, and there's books about that. But there are some best practices for creating healthcare VR apps. And in the book, we talk about what those are. And I, I won't bore you with all those details. Now, hopefully it's not boring, but, but um, we've actually researched this. And th there are certain commonalities. The most, the, the most important commonality is that before you make anything, you sit down with people, with patients, and find out what do they want? What do they need? What are their preferences? Uh, what are their attitudes about this? What do they want to experience before you build anything? So right now, I'm actually building a new treatment for irritable bowel syndrome. I happen to be a gastroenterologist. And we've just, in fact, before this me meeting, this, before this event, I was on the phone talking with our, our developers. And what's the first step? It's to go talk to patients and find out what they want. Because we can go off and make all sorts of great stuff and then bring it out and no one wants to look at it. So that's the first, so I talk about that in the book too. Um, we have a question here from Eugene. Um, I love the idea of VR, it would allow the pain relief without the side effects of the pills and allow you to do it safely. I got a loan of a headset and uh, one of the first times I used it, I was very angry and frustrated. And as soon as I put the headset on, the state was changed and I got a calmer and I got calmer. It's amazing technology. So. Yeah, thanks for, for saying that, Eugene. And, and again, it doesn't work for everyone, but when it works, it can be very comforting, very soothing. Um, and you know, some people think, oh, are you kind of like playing with my mind? Is this a psychological experiment? And, and what I say to that is, you know what? We all live in a virtual reality every day. Right now, the voice you hear in your head, no one else can hear it, only you can hear it. That song that you keep singing in your head all day, no one else can hear that. The dream that you saw last night, no one else saw that. That memory of a great vacation, only you can see it. So we're, we're living virtual reality constantly. But when people are sick, in pain, vulnerable, sometimes we lose the ability to imagine. We lose the ability to access that intrinsic capability. And all VR is doing is, is reconnecting us with our own inner ability to be creative and to imagine and to do it in a way that hopefully can support well-being. And so that feeling of being calm, you don't necessarily need VR for that, but you said here, Eugene, that you were angry and frustrated. So at that moment, you were having trouble accessing that ability and VR gave it to you in an instant. And all of a sudden you were calmer. And it's just really, that's how consciousness works. Okay, um, Phil Hendricks, uh, how do you determine the types of content to produce for VR in general and to use for a particular condition? And that's a great question. It kind of goes back to what I was saying before is really starting with the patients and finding out what they want. In general, we're, you know, there are different mechanisms of action. We call that MOA in medical parlance, um, mechanisms of action. So what I mean by that is, how is, what is the disease and how do we reverse it? And so I talk about that in the book too, and I won't go into too much detail, but there's a whole chapter dedicated to just that question. Um, all right, Candace Moore, how, have you tried uh, the minds, have you tried to have the mind stop cancer cells from multiplying? You know, it's so interesting. I've heard that question many times. And it is such an interesting question because, you know, I don't want to claim for a moment that VR can cure cancer, but, we do know, and we've been learning that mindful meditation does have effects on the immune system, does change levels of stress hormone like cortisol and adrenaline in the body. And that may have benefits uh, for well being, for neurologic and endocrine function. And, you know, maybe it's theoretically plausible that that could have benefits for blood flow to cancers. Uh, um, and uh, actually possibly change the way cancers multiply. Tom, did you have something to say there? Yeah, Doc, uh, just a, a point. I recently uh, was diagnosed with bladder cancer mm. and I, I use VR and my meditation to basically focus on the cancer and, and the bladder. 
and I don't know whether I couldn't prove it had any effect, but my my cancer when it was removed was non malignant, non aggressive, non evasive. So, you know, I go, okay, well, it helped. Yeah, I know I can definitely I can definitely prove it helped with my anxiety. Fair enough. And you know what? Uh, seeing is believing. So again, I wouldn't want to overstate the possible benefits, but it's a really good idea and not hard to do a visualization like that. So maybe we should do that. Wow, the questions keep coming. This is terrific. Uh, Teresa, do you want to uh, throw something in before I keep going? Oh, look at that. Les Posen's contacting us. <laughs> sure. Um, I was going to say, because there's so many, I don't want to, I feel like we'd probably end up here another hour if we got to all these questions. Um, so why don't we do... Um, Two more if you're down, uh, Dr. Siegel, and then I will close out with my question. Okay, great. Well, this one I can answer quickly, so I'm not gonna count it among the two, but do you collaborate with the Cedars Psychiatry Department? Absolutely, all the time. Itai Danovich is the chair of psychiatry and he works on all of our, all of our uh, VR studies. Um, does the level of realism or quality of the graphics in a VR experience affect the efficacy? Yes, to some degree. Um, it turns out, it does, the graphics don't need to be super fancy to be effective, but they need to be uh, fancy enough. Uh, and they also can't lead to, uh, they have to be, they can't cause people to get sick. So that's the biggest side effect is people getting sick or nauseous or, or getting vertigo because the graphics are too jumpy or, or you're on a roller coaster. That's stuff that people will just hate VR. Some people who try VR and they get in a roller coaster, they're like, I'm never using that again. That's a bad way to use VR, um, but so the graphics do make a difference and we try to keep things very steady and, and, and stable when we use it for healthcare. Um, so Les Posen happens to be a world expert on virtual reality and it's really cool that he's here with us today. He is in uh, Australia and he is in the book. So thank you Les for joining us this evening. He's, uh, um, uh, he, Les by the way, uses VR for flight phobia it's one of the world's experts using virtual reality and people will drive hundreds of miles because they don't want to get an airplane and uh, to visit him and then he uh, teaches them how to fly in VR then they'll get in an airplane and fly back which is pretty cool so he's asking if there are thoughts about enhancing creativity and dealing with performance anxiety yeah well performance anxiety is definitely a, a type of phobia as you know less and you know I think it would be interesting to see for people giving talks like this and getting nervous and anxious and being able to practice over and over again with an audience in front of you, not just imagining it, but literally seeing that audience. Creativity, enhancing creativity. I wish you weren't on uh, mute, Les, because I would ask you what you had in mind. I'm not sure uh, exactly how to enhance creativity, but there are such creative opportunities in VR. It's, it's incredible when you see these young kids. Uh, my daughter goes to Marlboro right down the street and they have a VR class. I mean, these kids are learning how to do three-dimensional art in VR, which is just amazing. So I wish I had time. We've got a few more here, but um, Teresa, I know you, you, I wanna give you a chance here to ask a question as well. Yeah, so sorry everyone that I am using my privilege as host to take the last question. Um, but Dr. Spiegel, you have answered a record 17 questions this past hour. Um, so I wanna give you a little break. And so my question, is I have a, a lot of friends in my circle who suffer from fibromyalgia, autoimmune disorders, and, and chronic pain. And a common complaint that I hear from them about um, American medicine in general is that they believe that American medicine maybe focuses too much on prescription drugs or intrusive surgeries to maybe to fix or heal them. And I'm really curious about what you think about how VR might change the direction overall yeah. of American medicine or, or um, how we could move away from automatically thinking that maybe a prescription drug or a surgery yes. is the answer. That's a great way to end. Uh, and I can, I can answer it for an hour, but I'm gonna try to make it short. Um, and you know, I talk a bit about this too at the beginning of the book. You know, there's this old idea that the mind and the body are separate and apart. And, you know, diseases of the body, like autoimmune conditions or inflammatory conditions, that affects the immune system, that's the body, but the brain's up here and somehow they're separated. And psychologists work on the brain and medicine doctors and surgeons work on the body. And sometimes we talk to each other. 
That couldn't be more wrong. Now that idea comes from Rene Descartes from 1644. Okay, when, when he said, you know, the brain is made of, it's not made of anything, it's immaterial. And the body's material and it's a machine that carries our mind around from place to place. And, um, and he had this whole theory that the brain and body connect via the pineal gland in the middle. It turned out that dominated Western biomedical thinking until the 1970s. You could say until today, but in the 1970s, and I, I, and I actually tell the story, this history in the book, um, this guy, George Engel said, you know what? We got to start rethinking this. The, the body um, is part of the brain. It, like the nervous system, the endocrine system, the immune system, it's part of the brain. It's just the part that's not in the skull. It's the extracranial part of our brain. And in fact, we now know that you can't know anything if you don't have muscles, bones, tendons, ligaments. You literally need those things to know things. You literally, your brain is in your body too. So the brain affects the body. The body affects the brain because it's all one system. And VR is just a way to tap into that cycle and modify it. And by modifying the brain, you definitely modify the body and vice versa. So for doctors to start, the VR is a way to force doctors to think about that in a different way. And I hope it will lead to new and different conversations, allowing for a broader understanding of how we should take care of people. And maybe it's VR today, maybe in 10 years, it'll be something else but it's a new way, it's an old way that is becoming new again of how to think about the brain and the body. Amazing. Um, thank you for answering my question. And thank you both, Dr. Brennan Siegel and Tom Norris for this absolutely enriching evening. I think for a lot of us, it felt like we had the privilege of taking a master class <laughs> with Dr. Siegel tonight um, about VR and medicine. Um, I want to say again, I'm going to paste the link to buy a copy of VRX online and to support Chevalier's book. Um, if you want to pick it up in store, go to our website, chevaliersbooks.com and put in a request. And lastly, Tom or Dr. Siegel, um, any last words for us before we say goodnight? Tom? Uh, yeah, uh, the, the one thing I'd like to, to reinforce is VR is a tool. As Doc said, it's not a panacea. It's not going to cure everything. It's a tool that you put in your tool, toolbox to deal with chronic pain, to do with a problem. And, and really, I think it, it depends on the coordination between the doctor and, and, and the patient to, to find the right program to get the most, most benefit for a healthy life. That's yeah. it. Can't say it better. Say All right, it. well, thank you both. Um, Dr. Siegel, any last words or shall we say no, I think Tom should have the last <laughs> word and, I, and, and he, said, he said it great. So thank you yeah. for having us. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us on this Thursday and evening. Thank you um, very much, it's a real privilege. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. All right, stay safe and healthy everyone. Yeah, everyone and support will... Chevalier's books. Yeah, okay. Let's keep Shivali's around, it. buy a book, That's and it. we will see you all later. Take care. All right. Bye. Take care. Stay well.